you know, BYD kind of doesn't have a ton of competition from anyone who's got a product that is superior to them. There's still a lot more market for Tesla to compete in and potentially to win, I think. Let's, uh, let's talk about the... Um... Next thing here is that we got new information about what's going on in China. We reported on this last week. It's looking like China's starting to boom again. It's catching up. So it used to be quite down at the beginning of this year. Here's Tesla Chan. He always keeps a good close eye on what's going on. He took a video of Tesla China's delivery center. Very, very busy yesterday. Just a quick view here. This is over the weekend. It was... Uh, the number of people there is, is massive. It's fun. I mean, everything. I mean, just so big. Here's Tesla. Today is Valentine's Day in China. In celebration of this, the Hangzhou Tesla Delivery Center has received many family and couples. And you can see here the photos. That's a lot of people. So the report of what happened last week, Tesla China reported 15.5 thousand vehicle sales for that week. That's a very strong report. And uh, this brings total 2024 China sales now to 350,000 vehicles. That's only 5,000 behind what, what was happening in 2023. So the gap to for the gap to reduce further next week needs only 13.9 thousand weeks. And then if you look at the trailing 12 week sales rate, um, you're 3,000 vehicles ahead of the same period last year. So you can see that the momentum is increasing. And uh, AJ, this is it from AJ. And what he's saying is that Tesla's strong China sales are likely driven by in increased purchase incentives, right? There's lots of incentives, local sales campaigns, including attractive financing deals, overall meaningfully larger EV adoption versus last year. So he shared this chart um, and you can see the red is uh, this year, 2024, and the blue was last year, uh, 2023. And we're now here on week 32. It's good to see this um, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, it's we want to be getting back to at least close to sales from last year, and hopefully by the end of the year, we can pass that in China. Um, but then if you step back and you look, okay, what is the significance of that? Well, this year is definitely a more difficult year for sales when you consider all of the macro headwinds that we have going on. And a lot right. of people have been um, saying that, you know, the economy in China is absolutely a disaster and, you know, things are going to melt down. Um, and so this is, you know, a data point that shows us that no, the economy in China is actually not doing bad. Um, and that's a positive thing. And I think um, people need to remember that Tesla with its direct to consumer sales model is a data point that leads other auto manufacturers data. Um, and so to see strong sales um, in China is good. The the counterpoint to that that we do need to also take into account is that Tesla has been continuing to unwind their delivery wave in China. And so, you know, if we're evening out deliveries in China instead of having everything at the beginning of the quarter shipped overseas and then everything at the end of the quarter delivered domestically, um, that it may seem like we're doing better earlier in the quarter than we're going to over the long run um, if we don't have that giant push in the back half of the quarter. So that is something also to keep a little bit of an eye on. But I would say just overall, it is encouraging to see Shanghai trending in this direction. And, um, you know, we still haven't gotten to the Model Y Juniper refresh. We still haven't gotten to any of the cheaper models. I would expect that when... Tesla releases, you know, the whatever the next generation vehicle that's not manufactured in the fully unboxed process that Elon has talked about that's going to be manufactured on existing manufacturing lines. Uh, I think that at least one, if not multiple of those variations are going to be sold out of Shanghai. And while there is going to be um, a little bit of a challenge in that switch over to whatever that new product is, if it comes in at a significantly lower price point, and puts more pressure in this growing EV market in China for these lower priced cars where, you know, BYD kind of doesn't have a ton of competition from anyone who's got a product that is superior to them at these prices that are really below where the uh, Model 3 is being sold at, then there's still a lot more market for Tesla to compete in and potentially to win, I think, as, uh, you know, someone who really has the highest quality technology in that space. 
Um, so yeah, we're, we're on a good track. Yeah. I'm very happy to hear this because, um, we, this is the year where we're in between the two growth waves, China's economy had slowed down a little bit. So it was concerning that we could have lost everything, uh, but it didn't happen. So you know, we're staying strong. And like you say, what's coming up is the more affordable models, the refresh of Juniper. And so far for Tesla to still do very well in China at this point is very critical. Um, we just reported last week that 50, over 50% 50 of all new cars sold now in China is a new electric vehicle, which includes hybrids. So it's growing really fast. In fact, the growth in China is what's showing the 17 million of new sales of electric vehicles um, this year. So it's it's like it's 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 making it, you know, it's primarily the main draw of growth. And so we need to do well. And then hopefully this year or next year, you're gonna by next year you'll have these new models. And so they'll continue to growth and in fact be more. When do you think that they're gonna sell the Cybertruck in China? Because that's the reason I say that is that's the, the latest, newest vehicle that Tesla did. If it's not gonna show up in mm -hmm. China for several years, then it's not gonna help. It is a good question. Um, I just don't know enough about what their regulations are around the size of the vehicle yeah. and if it could be sold as is or if it would have to have major overhaul on the design. I think if it is something that can be sold as is in China, that there may actually be a push to export Cybertrucks from the United States to China and sell them at the, you know, as the foundation, basically to offer Chinese buyers uh, an opportunity to purchase foundation series Cybertrucks before they roll into the lower trims um, sometime the end of this year, beginning of next year. Uh, if not, then I think it would probably be several years before it's available in China. Okay, so let's report on the Cybertruck. This is the, the latest information here was AJ again was reporting that Tesla Cybertruck outsold the Rivian R1T by 2.6 to 1 in the second quarter. This is according to Kelly's Kelly Blue Book estimates. Here's the table, Kelly Blue Book, as of August 12th. You can see in red here is Tesla Cybertruck, and you can see the blue is Rivian R1T. Tell me more what you're looking at here. Yeah, I mean, according to these estimates, we've sold well over 10,000 Cybertrucks in total in the United States. If you take the 2,800 and the 8,700 there and put them together. So yeah, really, I mean, I guess over 11. And um, that is really on track. The The peak of sales of the R1T was in what? second quarter of 2023, where they sold over 10,000 units in a single quarter. Um, according to this data, we haven't sold over 10,000 in a single quarter, um, but I think there is some questions around that. But obviously, we're at the very beginning of deliveries of the Cybertruck. There's so much demand for this vehicle. Um, and if Tesla just continues to ramp up production, I think this is the beginning of a trend where Cybertruck just massively outsells yeah. the R1T um, on the back of superior engineering, uh, superior branding, and just really product superiority overall, uh, especially as they bring down the cost. You know, I, I don't think that they're going to just sell an infinite amount of these Cybertrucks at this $100,000 foundation series price. Um, but over time, as they bring these prices down to the $70,000 or $60,000 mark, uh, which is a price point that Rivian's really going to have a hard time offering their vehicle at, that we're going to be talking about, you know, multiples probably verging on five, six, seven, eight, potentially even 10 times as many Cybertrucks being sold per quarter than yeah. R1Ts, um, which... I, you know, I love the the Rivian R1T. It's a beautiful truck. I think there's a it's a great product in a lot of ways, um, but they they do struggle to produce them in volume profitably, and I think that is just a very hard headwind to overcome over time. Yeah, they're selling at a seventy thousand dollars, and this is the foundation model Cybertruck over a hundred thousand dollars. They just started selling the Cybertruck. Here, you can see that in just two quarters, it's already surpassed. Mm -hmm quite quickly. So you're saying though, that this is not possibly those numbers for Cybertruck is underreported. Here's Bradford Ferguson saying that these numbers are false. Tesla sold at least 17,000 Cybertrucks through the end of June. And the way he knows that is by looking at these, um, I guess the, uh, 
VIN number? That's numbers? a VIN number. Yep. So uh -huh. if you can zoom in, the end of that VIN yep. number is the number 17, one, or yeah, 17,524. Yep. And that is essentially a serial number. Now, sometimes there are vehicles that don't get produced. So that's not an exact, uh, you know, total production yeah. number that you can extract from that, but it is roughly in the ballpark. So, I mean, you could really be looking at anywhere from 15 to 17,000 total vehicles um, that have been delivered to customers based on a VIN number like that. And um, yeah, this, this, owner here says that in July they purchased a which would have been you know after the end of Q2 but they purchased a cyber truck and the VIN that they received was in the 21,000 range um, and so it's it's highly likely that by the end of June we had delivered well over 15,000 total um, which would have put production and deliveries in Q2 of cyber trucks above that 10,000 you know probably somewhere around 12 13,000 at least. Uh, in a single quarter, which would have surpassed the record for even the R1T deliveries. What's your estimate for 2024 at this point? Has that changed? Um, I'm hoping that we can get to the somewhere between 80,000 and 100,000 vehicles delivered. You still at the 80,000, 100,000, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is ramping up meaningfully. They may have, to, they're not going to deliver that many at the foundation price. They'll have to, you know, have some other mm -hmm. options. Um, but if they if they can continue on the progress that they've made in the speed of the ramp, um, I think we've got a shot at it. Wow. Okay, that's still quite high. Surprised uh, because I thought that they're selling the foundation, staying at the high point here. Um, they'll need to switch that at some point. Didn't sound like that they were going to do that. I mean, if they want to be on a run rate of two hundred fifty thousand cars right. early in twenty twenty five, they've they've got a long way to go. They do. Okay, so let's go uh, full self-driving. This happened last week, but it looks like that yesterday it's, it's rolling out even more. Full self-driving 12.5.1.3 is now rolling out to customer vehicles, not just the early access people. We're only seeing vehicles with Harbor 4 receiving this update, but I think yesterday they started saying that they're starting to see it in Harbor 3 as well, but we haven't any confirmation on that right now. So it says here, yeah, this is the one, the third and largest wave of full self-driving has gone out last 10 minutes, whereas the previous waves only included Model Y, this update is now expanding to Model S, X, M, three vehicles. So I'm curious to see somebody with a three coming out and saying that they've received it. Well, that is the Model 3, but it's still hardware 4. I did some digging in the comments and people are oh, still yeah. saying this is only hardware 4, even though it's Model 3s, it's Model 3s with hardware 4. Um, and that tweet was from yesterday, that third wave of 12.5.1.3. And so it is good to see this continuing to expand. That means that the quality testing is going well. Um, and as long as it continues to expand to larger and larger waves of hardware for owners to, to the point that everyone in North America who has hardware for who has purchased the system actually has access to this 12.5 branch, um, then I think that bodes really well for when they do get this running on uh, 12 point or hardware three, uh, that it'll probably go out really, really fast to anyone and everyone who has hardware three. And then uh, this is more information about Tesla's Megapack energy business. Construction has begun in Queensland, Australia on a new $750 million Tesla Megapack battery storage facility. Man, I love how big these numbers are. <laughs> That's a big number, $750 million. The 300 megawatt, 1,200 megawatt hour Stanwell battery marks the start of the transformation of the major coal center into a green energy hub. Here's a photo of what it looks like here, 1,200 megawatt hour mega batteries. That's great. Look how many that they have. This is just one area. So they've begun construction there. One of the largest battery projects in the state. And uh, it's set to use 324 of Tesla's 2XL mega pack units. That's a lot. And then... Um, Project gained a $448 million investment from the government, Queensland government. And it's the largest of its kind, create 80 jobs. Um, when a battery like these are publicly owned, it means Queensland Queenslanders themselves benefit, not overseas shareholders. And then they come into addition of, this is in addition to other Stanwell company projects, including big batteries in Tarong and Calide. Once they show that it's working ROI in one place, they're just going to keep growing it. 
So this is what it looks like. There's a planned five gigawatt hour investment from Stanwell to convert these fuel, uh, fossil fuel generation efforts into a hub for renewables. So there you go. So it's massive. Yeah. And I mean, just for people to realize, we were talking about 300 megawatts, uh, mm -hmm. I believe, or, and now we're talking about five gigawatts. So um, mm -hmm. that's, you know, a meaningful increase in total. And that it is just showing, you know, Queensland is one of the places where we have seen some of these big battery projects roll out. Uh, I think a number of times the largest overall installation uh, has been in Queensland somewhere. And so this seems to be something that for Australia's grid specifically, the economics of this are working and working well. And, uh, you know, another thing to call out from the article there was that they said, we want to see continued downward pressure on energy prices. And these big battery projects are part of how we do that. Um, and so this is making not only are these installations paying for themselves, that's why they're continuing to invest in installations of the size, but they're paying for themselves while the price of energy is coming down for customers in Australia. And so it's great to see you getting more energy uh, you know, for the return on investment to make sense for the project and for, at the end of the day, the customers uh, to enjoy lower energy prices because of that, which is the whole reason that Megapack is a product. And as they continue to ramp up production of these and bring down the cost of them, um, that economic story will be one that plays out in more jurisdictions besides just some of the most expensive jurisdictions in the world.